everybody. Um, OK, today I'm talking about the practicalities of distributed systems. This is a complicated idea. A lot of folks, when they come up here, they're going to talk to you about specific things about distributed systems, or they're going to talk to you about the theoretical stuff. This talk is specifically and intentionally designed to be a general overview and about the practicalities of what it means for when we put things into production. This is also a talk I gave five years ago, but updated and revamped. Um, the company Basho that used to have the database REOC had a conference many years ago. Uh, I gave this talk, and a bunch of other people did too. And then the YouTube account for Basho got closed. And it was a, a time in my life which I was actually pretty excited about this talk, and folks had been asking for it again. And so after it disappeared from the internet, it seemed like time for me to do another version of it, something updated for 2018. OK, so there's some re things that we should talk about. One of them is why you should listen to me. Um, I was at Twitter from 2009 to 2014. That was 120 people to 3,600 people. Along the way, I went from like a little baby engineer to a fairly mature and senior engineering person. Um, I worked on a bunch of problems, including being one of the founding members of the anti-spam team. I worked on Ford Secrecy at Twitter after the Snowden releases. I've worked on incidents like the Heartbleed response uh, and worked on distributed database work for Cassandra, MySQL, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, a couple years ago, I was fortunate enough to be on one of the first engineers working on Let's Encrypt and help ditch ship a few months, uh, a couple of years ago, which you may, be now be use you may be using on your website right now to provide HTTPS. And if you're not, I would strongly recommend it. The team's fantastic. So I've done a couple of things, like a couple of things. But now I'm also a small business owner. I've got this little website called howsmysl.com. I sell subscriptions to other websites for them to use my website to figure out whether users' browsers are secure. And I had an intention when I wrote this talk five years ago to be scale invariant. And now as a small business owner, I am extremely aware of that. What it takes to be not just a big company working with thousands of machines when we're talking about distributed systems, but also the little stuff, the tiny work that it takes when you've got just you know, one or three or five or 10 people. Okay. So we're talking about building and running distributed systems. So I'm going to give you a quick foundation about what makes distributed systems different. Uh, when I was a little baby engineer, I would get asked this, and I would say something along the lines of, well, latency. And people would kind of hem and haw and say, nah, kind of. What's really different is failure. The state space of failure for distributed systems is much larger than for a single machine system. This is o repeated over and over again. I'm going to give you a quick subset of the kinds of failures that you'll see. One of them is like a garbage collection failure causing just a couple of your machines transiently to like go offline. And it looks, oftentimes, uh, I've had engineers come to me and say that they've got some network problem because they're looking at their network input and output out from certain machines. And I have to ask them like, hey, what's actually going on with your heap? Um, another thing is a client might get stuck to an overloaded process. They've got some very long socket connect timeout. And you've got this one machine that's taking forever to actually resolve connections. And over time, transiently and implicitly, some of your clients just kind of gather and all try to connect to this one machine over and over and over again. And it, and it happens, and it looks weird, and they bunch up, and you can never quite figure out what's going on. And then, of course, you have the MongoDB problem, which is where you do a socket right over here, and it says it worked, but of course, on the other side, it fails. Um, these are all partial failures, and that would, that's what makes this hard, is that there's it kind of works. Like, distributed systems kind of work all the time. And that's what's actually cool about them, and we're going to get into that. But they also kind of are always failing a little bit. And so one of the things that you're going to notice is that the, there are certain implicit questions that get really, really hard. Like, the hardest problem you're going to have is fixing slowness. You're going to have an engineer, if you're lucky, or another PM, or God help you, a user is going to come to you and tell you that it's slow. And you're going to have to figure out what it means for slowness. Like, they say, oh, well, it just took a long time to post. And you're going to come back and say, oh, that could mean this thing, or this thing, or this thing, or this thing. And the state space is so large that it's impossible to figure out with our usual single machine tools. So what's cool about distributed systems is that these failures and the state space of failure is so broad. But in actuality, we can create reliability. We can create more robustness. We can create resiliency out of having more machines, out of having machines talking to one another. Of course, the obvious stuff is the redundancy when we talk about, like, if you have more than one machine and one machine fails, you can always have another machine picking up the slack. That's cool. 
Well, there's actually some other more interesting things that you can do to build partial availability in your systems right now. A classic example of building partial availability into the design of your system is search. This started happening in, I think, the late 60s with Ink to Me and a couple of other big search engines, and now all of them do it. We've got you know, Google and Yahoo and Bing and um, Twitter, of course, uses this stuff. It's the same idea. You've got, let's say, five machines. And your index is too big to fit on any one of them. And so what you actually do is you have a user come in and they, ask, they send a query to your first muxing system. And then that machine actually sends the query out to those five index machines. And then those index machines go through and they like find the most relevant documents and then return the most relevant documents after back to this muxing machine. The muxing machine then ranks all the documents that they've gotten back, resolves them in another list, and just takes the top end from those machines and sends it back to the user. It's a cool, simple little design. But what's really great about it is that if one of those indexing machines goes down, you can actually still return decent results to the user, even in that partial outage. Because those results might get a little bit worse, but it doesn't actually change the fact that you want to get something back to the user at all. And that's partial availability. It means that you can build systems and have designs that stay up even in the face of failure and actually give good results that you can straight up make money off of with slightly less work. Also, so the monorail was something that I worked on at Twitter. It was a monolithic Ruby on Rails web app. Uh, we had started adding who to follow. If you're familiar with Twitter at all, it's this little doodad. It was originally in the top left here that it would tell you just other people that you might like to follow. That's it. It was a great little system, but it was also the first service that we had that was coming through the monorail that we would actually connect to from the monorail that wasn't just a database or something. And what happened is, um, who to follow, like a lot of new systems, uh, was buggy. And it had problems. It had performance issues. Um, and one of those, and so folks would try to solve that by increasing the timeout. And they would say, OK, well, every time we time out who to follow, we're actually sending back a fail whale, just an error message, whole cloth, to the user instead of rendering their home timeline. And so they kept increasing the timeout because who to follow was having performance issues. And then we started running into the overall timeout of five seconds or whatever, starting to be too small because who to follow is like one second or two second timeout. If who to follow is having a bad day and a couple of the databases were having a bad day, we'd start responding like back blank pages because we were taking too long completely. Um, and so the actual fix for this was, okay, we can fix the who to follow problems, but there's actually a more generic problem that we're addressing here, which is who to follow isn't that important. Like it's not important enough to like ship an error back to the user just because one little doodad on the web page didn't work. And that's partial availability. When we're talking about distributed systems, we're not just talking about like, OK, redundancy, OK, horizontal scalability. We're talking about sometimes optionality is the availability. Like, you don't need to ship every feature. You don't need to use every index in your search. Sometimes you can like not use the geolocation results. And there's, it takes actual like thinking outside of our usual understanding when we're building our apps and systems to get there. Okay. Um, the problem with distributed systems is that because there is a much larger state space, it's difficult for us as engineers or QA people or whoever to actually exercise every edge case out there. And so we have this difference between, we've known this as a problem from single machine systems, that we see the code on the page, we believe we know what the code is going to do, and then we run it and it does something very different. This gets much worse in distributed systems, and it gets to be more difficult when we start having to think about an observation of the system in a different way. Instead of relying on user reports, or looking on our own usage, or knowing that our integration tests are gonna cover every bit of functionality, we instead do things like using metrics. And these are like broad aggregate things of like how many messages are coming in, how many are successfully going out, how much latency are we using to do that work, and the variety of like, you know, grouping of act status codes and whatnot. And I want to take a real quick dive to the second here. If you're calculating latency, please don't use averages. <laughs> there is zero distributed systems in the world that have a useful average. The 
graph of latencies do not look like a normal bell curve. They all have a very long tail. So if you actually want to see what, like, one out of every 10 request loads look like, you've got to look at the 90th percentile. You can't just rely on mean, because it'll tell you some great number over here that looks dope and you want to brag about it. But your actual, your one out of every 10 users is seeing this terrible latency out here. And it's, that's like key. This is a difficult thing and it's, um, it comes up all the time. So that's cool. We've got these broad metrics based systems where we expose metrics, we send them out to some other system and we can make dynamic charts where we can do time correlations to find bugs. They're really handy. You've got system A at some counter going up, system C going at some counter lower, and you're like, there's a difference, so maybe it's system B in the middle. Okay, they're broad. And there's some new stuff that we started doing five years ago, but nobody was really talking about it very much. And it's the idea of tracing, which is metrics are great because they give you these broad aggregates that you can work on, but they're very difficult. They don't talk about the actual system of communication between machines. And tracing is the idea that we should actually tr track one request coming into our system through all of the different systems it talks to, log that out in some formatted way, so we can actually build a tree of communication. There's tons of systems that are now able to support this, uh, from the Google stuff that's called Stackdriver has this built in, I believe, and then the usual cloud providers and yada yada. And we're starting to push towards this. Um, What's very, very cool about it is that with a, just a couple of IDs, you can start associating data like, okay, for this error that we saw, we sent back a 500 status code or whatever, it was with this user ID, and we talked to these systems, and it took this long, and we can see that in one tree view, and it's great, and it's the kind of thing that we're like, is the next step for all of us to be building into our systems. It's stuff I've used regularly. Um, and it gives you this focused, narrow view, while metrics can provide aggregate, broad views. Okay, I want to do a real quick side note on profiling. Um, profiling is a good tool to have. You should have a profiler, you should know how to run a profiler. Those are good. They tell you how fast your computer can work. They're uh, relatively inexpensive to run on your own machine. You can test these things very well. I've even run a couple in production from a time or two. Um, but profiling struggles in a distributed systems environment overall. And it's not something that we can rely on to tell us much about distributed systems. We can use them when we have focused questions to ask, but you can't, it's got two problems. One, profilers even today are a little too expensive to actually run whenever you want. And most distributed systems problems are transient. They happen at 3 a.m. because a certain subset of users that you've got are all on the machines at the same time. They happen when only some people are using this one word and it gets partitioned weird in your systems. It only happens, these are, it only happens once in a while because of a combination of garbage collection and timeout on certain machines. These are transient problems and profilers expect to be run while the issue is happening. And so then we have to fall back to asynchronous styles of getting observation out, which is metrics and tracing and whatnot. The second problem with profilers is, in my opinion, slightly more egregious. It's not true of all profilers, but it pretty much is. Uh, the second one is that in the same way that latencies need to be calculated with percentiles, not averages, profilers all just give you a smeared out average. And so what they tell you is how fast that method one and method two, method two maybe looks a little bit slower on average than method one, but it won't tell you that method one, when it goes bad, it goes really, really bad. And so you can't actually see that method one might actually be your performance problem. You just see it smeared out into one scalar value for both methods. It's struggles, which is why we talk about metrics so much and why we talk about observation like tracing and whatever. Okay, let's move on from that. Releases should change a metric. Releases are deploys of code plus some other stuff. We'll get to that. But every release is a hypothesis about what's going to happen in your system. You have a hypothesis, you have written this code, you believe it will change your systems in certain ways, and that should be expressible, at least for the kind of work that I do, and that you probably do, as a metric. There are, of course, quality of life things that are non-quantifiable features, but there are certainly, for most of your deploys, there is a metric that you could look at and see if it went up or went down, and it should be able to change that. Of course, the more systems that you get, the easier it is to quantify. Okay. 
I also want to take a brief question. You may, you may have mentioned those that I haven't talked about logs much. Um, I use freeform text logs in my systems. It's the first thing that's going to break. I know that's going to break. Um, but freeform text logs lie. Um, and we have to be careful about that when we're talking about many machines, or even just more than one. Is that uh, common problems tend to get overlogged. I remember uh, we had some service discovery stuff in the web server I was helping build, and we spent on an incident an extra 10 minutes looking to figure out why we were having, struggling to have issues, and we saw these piles of exceptions in our logs. And they're all from service discovery. And we were like, oh man, okay, we must have a service discovery problem. We started digging around and trying to figure out how to make that work. When in fact, that was actually, those errors were just about some other data center connections that we knew were never gonna work and that we hadn't brought up the data center yet. Like, it was just nonsense. And that's really common in these freeform text logs. You just splat stuff in there. We as engineers have certain expectations of what is gonna be useful and informative to uh, other people and ourselves, and we just get it wrong with these freeform text logs. And since we can't reduce that output, like you can, you can have the most fine-grained logging output ever, and you're still going to get what's, you're still going to get it wrong about what's important. Because uncommon problems will then get buried. It's hard to find them, and then you're also going to see if you really understood the problem enough to log it, you almost certainly would have fixed the bug. Like, that's actually why most of these freeform text logs are busted. And you can't, it's very difficult to use freeform text logs as time correlations to find problems in the same way that we can with tracing and metrics, because we don't have multiple sources with, like, actual numbers that we can do math on. Okay. Uh, let's come back up from the, some of the practicalities to a more generic point. Okay. Avoid coordination. Coordination, as human beings, we feel is a relatively simple problem. If we were to take a vote in here on like what number we should put up on the screen, we could reasonably do that with some rough consensus. But coordination and consensus is actually the most difficult problem in distributed systems. It is perhaps the difficult problem in distributed systems. It turns out that we've done decades of research on how to make machines agree on simple numbers. And that is still an active field of endeavor because for two reasons, one, Coordination turns out to be very difficult for human beings to understand. There are so many failure modes that you have to handle whenever just changing some little bit of data that it gets too complicated for us. You can go read the reason why the Paxos and Raft exist. Paxos was originally attempt to simplify coordination. And it created this, you may be familiar with Paxos, it was this parliamentary paper. It was written by Lamport um, in the style of an actual parliament. And he wrote it as if it was an actual parliament making ballot measures. And it's still too hard for most people to understand. And so that's why we have raft and a whole bunch of other things. So the first concept is just coordination is too hard for human beings to really grapple with very well. There's a reason why we struggle with it. And the second problem is it's, it's a struggle for computers as well. It's actually very resource intensive to do coordination, to get consensus for every machine. You have to bring in it's very chatty. You have to go back and forth between machines. Naive forms of this get very, very chatty where you have to connect with every single other machine and agree on some things. And it's also, of course, you have the problem that the speed of light has a limit, causes a limit on the amount of information we can transfer, how quickly that information can transfer. And so there's, only, there's always gonna be some basic latency that we take in. Um, so coordination is something that we as engineers cordon off, we make smaller. Instead of trying to get, every time a message comes in, we don't go to every single other machine and go, hey, do you own this? Do you own, do you got this, man? You got this? Instead, what we do is we look at IDs, and we get those systems when they come up to agree on what ID ranges that they're gonna coordinate over. This is why ETCD exists, why Zookeeper exists, why Chubby over at Google exists, is because there are these places in which we want to cordon off coordination, where the failure modes are difficult, where the chattiness happens, and make it small and as small as possible, while not being too understandable. Um, but along with that cordoning off of problems, we have a similar thing when you're a fancy distributed systems engineer who comes up and gives talks or whatever. But for you, who's got 
pro like most of the folks here, I mean, I've got a database and some web apps and a bunch of systems that talk to one another, just like everybody else here. The tricks that we do for distributed systems is we rely on the enormous amount of literature for single machine systems to carry us through while we're doing distributed systems work. If a problem can fit into memory, that means you've got 60 years of research to rely on. You've got 60 years of libraries that have been built, systems and tools that have been designed for you. I mean, if you can fit into memory, you can run awk over it, and you can do all the data analytics you want in no time at all. And so, if we can, but with distributed systems, we've only been doing this in production for 20-ish years, a little bit more. And the amount of research and tools and availability for that stuff is much less. And so what we find is not only do we get faster and better results by putting things into memory together because of the way cache coherence works and the way batching exists, but also because we can just shove it off to our already existing tools. And so we want to find places to, for, to put it all into memory in one place. That is actually a, a useful and good design. So we don't have it spread out across the whole cluster, but instead coordinated and consolidated. Okay, now of course we talked about some of the practicalities here. One of the practicalities that you're gonna have to build in as you're working on stuff is this idea of back pressure. It comes from plumbing, which I really like infrastructure. I do a lot of like housing advocacy and whatnot because I think infrastructure is super important. Um, and back pressure is an idea from plumbing where you've got these very big pipes. And they actually have a very widely variable amount of water in them at any time because of how rain works and how reservoirs work. These big pipes, they've got a lot of water pressure and it changes very often. But at the end of the game, to fill these water bottles, to pull water out of the faucet, those are tiny little pipes that you don't want to blow out. And so what do plumbers do in order to make sure that these giant variations in water don't destroy our homes and cause like giant floods inside? Well back pressure. They make these systems and designs such that when water flows too hot, comes in too hot, too hard, into our smaller pipes, instead gets pushed out when that water pressure reaches a certain level. And there's actually like systems and designs everywhere throughout our plumbing system, including inside your sink generally. If you see that little hole that's actually in your sink that's like a backfill? Okay. And it's the idea that the same metaphors that apply to software as well. There's got to be reactions for when you're taking on too much load or your systems will fall over. And they will fall over in ways that are implicit and difficult to debug. They will come out as it's slow instead of it's returning errors. And it's slow is much more difficult to solve than it's returning errors. You're going to have heap fragmentation problems. You're going to have garbage collection problems. You're going to have just weird timeouts in places that you didn't expect, all because we didn't, if you don't build in back pressure. Okay, so that's great, Jeff. You've now convinced me that there's something called back pressure. It sounds useful. What are we talking about? Well, one naive form of it is just dropping messages on the floor. If a message comes in and your system is overloaded, one of the easiest things you can do is just say, okay, return an okay message, but actually do nothing with the message. This is not the usual one, but some systems actually can abide by this. I would strongly recommend uh, adding some metrics so that you know when you're doing this in case somebody gets angry later. Uh, but another, of course, better one is returning overload error message responses. This is a bunch of systems do this naturally. I built this at the Twitter web server when we over went over some humble mumble number of requests per second. I knew that these systems experimentally <laughs> couldn't handle that many systems, and so instead of us just getting really slow and causing timeouts and bad behavior, we'd actually reject messages. And we'd get an alert fired saying, hey, you're taking a lot of messages on these one machines, go figure out what's going on or make this faster. Um, overload responses are very, very common. They're very, very useful uh, because clients typically can handle overload better than the server can. Clients know if they can do a retry. Clients know if they want to try another machine, Clients know that maybe they can tell the user they're like, hey, this feature isn't working right now. So you want to tell, you want to get the clients to do this work, not the server. The server is like, it's got other work to do. And of course, there's another little back pressure thing like timeouts and exponential back offs. Um, time is an important, is an important resource to your cluster as memory, as CPU. Uh, the time of your users is valuable, 
you want to get towards you know 100 millisecond render responses. That is basically the limit of human perception, where we're able to actually visually distinguish things at about 100 milliseconds. So the closer you get to 100 milliseconds, the more magical and wonderful the experience feels for your users. Um, okay, coming back out of back pressure, let's talk about another practicality here. Uh, deploys and releases are not the same thing, and you don't want them to be the same thing. Um, this is a classic technique that was originally done, I think Flickr maybe talked about it way back in the day, so shout out to SmugMug, I guess. Um, so uh, feature flags are an idea from A-B testing, where they gave two different UI tests, uh, two different UI designs to users, and then had them you know, figure out which one they wanted, and it was a feature flag of like how much percentage they would give each design out to the user. That's how it was originally created. But you can actually use this as a massively powerful distributed systems tool. This is actually one of the best things that you can do is to add feature flags and add resiliency to your system. How it works is like this. Um, whenever you're merging code in, you continue to, you add like a little if statement. It looks something like this. Uh, this is the one we used at Twitter. It was called Decider. Uh, and for each request that comes in, or whatever equivalent that you've got, uh, you would hash and take a modulus and include like the key's name, the feature's name or whatever to make sure that it was well distributed or whatever, and just choose a code path, either true or false. And that toggle was something that you could actually change in runtime from another system. And we get live updated within a minute or so, and it would go down, it would choose to either send users down one path, code path or another code path. And you can do this for infrastructure stuff. For instance, if you've got a new storage system that you're using for users, but you don't know if it's going to be able to handle all of your write path, if you can handle all the traffic, you can actually put up a prototype and send darkly without using the responses. You can actually just duplicate the writes to your normal storage and then at some lower percentage to this other newer storage. And you actually test that out. And then you can do similar stuff where if you're starting to use data from a new system and reading from it, you can start, uh, you have a decider flag, and all that decider flag is just makes both queries and then just compares them. And actually tells you how well you're doing. We actually use that regularly for every migration system we ever did. A lot of stuff when we were pulling out a monorail, we'd pull out a user storage or a social graph storage or whatever, and we would actually look at the old system that we already had in place and the new system. We would just compare the results. It's a neat trick. And you can do this just for normal code paths. What's great is that it adds resiliency just for normal code paths as well, where you don't have to worry about like, hey, we're going to do a deploy. We do this a lot at Let's Encrypt. They did this a lot at Let's Encrypt, where we're going to do a deploy of a feature that we like, but in case it goes wrong, we want a quick way to turn it off without a deploy. They've got a great deploy system over at Let's Encrypt. It's very fast. But if you're doing multiple deploys, or you've got bunches of patches going out at once, you don't want to have to deal with the merge conflicts and unwinding that you'll need to do in order to deploy new code. It's much easier to just turn off the feature. And it also means that you can ship without the feature turned on, turn it on for a little bit, see if it works at all, and then turn it back off. And you can do experimental designs this way. This is the kind of science that you can work. I'm getting close on time here, so I'm gonna have to move a little bit fast. But I do have to say one thing about this. If you start doing lots of feature flags, people are gonna have, you're gonna have folks, you maybe, are gonna have some reactions to these if statements. There's gonna be a lot of every piece of code should only do one thing kind of questions. Shouldn't this be, couldn't this be simpler? And the answer is, I mean, you can do some things with proxy objects and other, you know, fancy design pattern stuff. But at the end of the day, these if statements, they're trading local complexity for global resiliency and global simplicity. And once we start thinking about distributed systems in that way, that we can make trade-offs between local complexity here in order to get global simplicity everywhere, we're thinking in a much stronger and more resilient way. Okay. Uh, this also implies that multiple versions are the norm. I've talked a lot about, implicitly about migrations, about new systems, about having to move data between them, and that's true for everything. You're gonna have multiple versions of systems. You're gonna have multiple versions of software. You're gonna have multiple versions of the same software out. You're gonna have multiple versions of a user's data in different systems. And that is normal. And it's freaky deaky. 
And it's very stressful the first time that you realize that there is a whole other set of failure states that you're going to have to worry about. But it's normal. This, and it's OK. And you're not screwing up by doing that. You obviously don't want to let it go crazy. That's nutty. But you are going to have this issue. This is just the basic bare bones of doing distributed systems. Also, very quickly, data center schedulers are actually totally worth it if you've got more than a, a few people and more than a few systems running. Um, I actually use it for my stuff just because I never wanted to touch Chef or Puppet or Ansible ever again. So I used like, some Google Container Engine stuff, whatever. But they're actually very useful because they give you a whole set of deploy tools and a way of thinking about your systems that gets you more efficiency. I mean, I'm gonna, like, we got a bunch of Kubernetes talks at this conference, so I don't want to give you the pitch for Kubernetes. But there's a reason why these things exist and why they're so nice. Like, deploys get easier, they get standardized. You start thinking about these things as building blocks instead of as platonic ideal machines that are running one service only. And you start getting in a, you, you work up a level of abstraction. OK. This was actually like one of the reasons why when we got, when I was on, I can't talk, oh man. Let me just say there was a very large amount of anti-spam that we killed off, and I directly associate that with our ability to deploy on Mesos in our first quarter of existence on the anti-spam team. Spam used to be a huge embarrassing problem for Twitter, and it very quickly became not that big of a deal because this team was very effective and had very quick turnarounds that we did not previously able to do. We could put out new systems. We could put out new designs. It was great. And okay, now I'm going to do really quick, since I've got a couple of minutes left here, uh, I'm going to do some thought leadership. Uh, also, it's really hard to get three different smart quotes all at once. That's actually like, I would recommend if you're on OSX, give that a shot. You're going to, it takes a trick. OK. The first thing is that, uh, I never, ever, 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 ever want to hear another software engineer ever say that something is political and therefore bad. Collaboration is politics. If we want to work in distributed systems, that means that we're tending to work with more people, we're tending to work with more teams, and because the web exists, we're going to have to work with organizations outside of ourselves. We're going to use other services. We're going to use other people's code. And these are people problems first. Like our technical stuff, the stuff that I talked about for the majority of this, is a small problem embedded in a larger social space. The kinds of stuff, collaboration, getting people to migrate to your system, people to think about your system, to like your system, these are like social issues. They require feedback loops between not just computers, but humans. And if we're willing to talk about how communication works for systems and machines, we should absolutely be able to talk about that when we talk about humans. And we should engage just as deeply on that stuff. It's real. Also, I'm going to do, OK, all right. One last, I'm going to moralize at you. Uh, we don't talk a lot about morality and ethics at conference talks, unless you're doing specific stuff for it. And I am going to give you some, we're going to do it, because it's important enough. And because when I gave this talk in 2013, a version of this talk in 2013, I was also on a, I was literally working in, in response to the Snowden releases, trying to make it so that large organizations couldn't scoop up our users' data get a key, and then go backwards in time and read all of our users' data. Because what organizations are doing, you can agree, like there are certain nation states that we know explicitly are doing it, which means a bunch more are doing it. We have organizations that are literally scooping up as much of the internet's traffic as they can, raw internet traffic. They have got machines and various ISPs. This is not tinfoil hattery. This has been known about for minimum five years. This is well documented. Multiple orgs are doing this. They're scooping out all of the internet's traffic as much as they can. Encrypted, unencrypted, they don't care. They prefer the unencrypted because then they can very easily go backwards in time and see every whisper between loved ones and friends. They can use this data to query backwards and see an entire history of the things that we've whispered to people that we love. And I don't like that. I don't think you like that either. And so we've got to build systems that are resilient to that. There's a moral necessity for us to encrypt all of our data. There's a moral necessity for us to encrypt our users' data, to build systems that think about these things, to build out end-to-end encryption, to build out, at the very least, HTTPS as a default. It's also a moral necessity for us to minimize the amount of data that we're keeping. 
There's a reason why uh, the GDPR is happening in Europe. You may be familiar with it. It's a new privacy regulation imposed by the European Union. A lot of people are stressing out about it. It's kind of difficult. There are certainly problems, some, some stuff that sucks about it. But one of the things that, it, why it was created, the reason for its existence, the reason why the EU goes so hard on privacy is because the kinds of data that our system collects are the, is the kind of data that literal Nazis used in World War II to track and kill people. And we have organizations that are trying to get access to this data today. And so we are at a point now where it is our duty as software engineers, as implementers, to take on this moral task, to do IP hashing if we need IP hashing, to, do, to drop IP addresses if we don't care about it, to remove as much user data as we can if we're not going to use it. These are moral requirements, and we cannot ignore them anymore. OK, that's it. And I'm going to take questions now. I was wondering how you go about, especially for encryption stuff, um, about your social aspect here, how do you go about avoiding people scraping and using it for bad things all the time? Yeah, 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 okay. So there are a couple of uh, tricks that come along. I'm gonna grab some water here. Um, there's some implicit stuff. Uh, you gotta avoid using auto-recommending IDs uh, in order to, for user data or whatever, because it's very easy to accidentally start authorizing every user or some subset of users if they just can guess an ID space. If they can guess your ID space, you're screwed. So try to make that like a fairly random, unique idea. Do some hashing or whatever if you need to. Um, Slack and folks, a lot of folks do this stuff. The other one is you're going to, um, You're gonna have to build out, there's of course rate limiting that you can build. Uh, in a world in which I'm talking about data minimization, uh, you can cordon off the things that need to know about IP addresses. You can also do this thing called IP hashing. Unfortunately, I can't give you a design right now, but I, I have one that I could tell you about how to, how to hash IPs. A couple of folks have done it. Actually, quite a few folks have done it, but nobody's written it down in a public place, which is very strange. Um, so, uh, you can do IP address hashing and do rate limiting, of course. Um, folks do a lot of that per user. Strongly recommend, like, most of your stuff, your scraping that's being scraped is, I don't know the particulars of your system, um, but I assume most of them are logged in. Um, so I would recommend putting rate limiting and associating with the authentication stuff. Usually it's easier if your authentication system lives outside of your main app, and you can start doing really interesting things when it's not tied in directly and you actually pass, like, Instead of your app doing all of the authentication work and reading cookies and whatnot, you actually have a layer in front of it that sends back a user ID header after doing the cookie work, and you can usually do rate limiting much easier there, that kind of system. But it's hard. It's, it depends on the system. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. What kind of tracing do you use to get visibility into event-driven architectures? I'm so sorry. Uh, the echo is really bad up here. What kind of tracing would you use to get visibility into event-driven architectures? Which kind of architectures? Event-driven. Oh, event-driven architectures. How, what, what kind of tracing would you use to get visibility? Oh, there? yeah, so typically what most folks do is similar in um, the Go programming language, they have this idea of a context object, and you pass it around. Um, this is actually really, really common. Um, uh, Twitter, we had Finagle, had it built into like its crazy functional whatever stuff and it was actually like a implicit parameter, basically. But you actually just pass around a context object, and you can pull, uh, and you associate trace ID with it. And it does sound crazy, because you're like, wouldn't that context object have to go everywhere? And the answer is yes. Anywhere that does network IO is where a context object with some trace data has to go. And it's one of those trade-offs, like I mentioned with the if statements, you take on some local complexity in order to add global resiliency. It sucks, but it's a, it's a thing. Um, so one of our products has a little bit of an issue with spammers right now, and they're actually working on an initiative they call the Spammer Hammer. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But uh, I was wondering what kind of uh, like tools or techniques did you find most effective with identifying and reducing yeah. spam in your systems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I can give you like some quick evolutionary history of the anti-spam that I've worked on. Um, the very first thing, one of the things that you uh, can do, not the very first thing, but it's got to be number two or number three, is I would strongly recommend you make a Schadenfreude graph. And that is for you and your team to be looking at. It's got to be a chart of just how many things you've prevented going out and how many users you've suspended, and it feels really good. You will feel, it feels very nice to ruin somebody's day who's a bad person. Um, the next thing I would have to say is uh, you, of course, are never going to solve spam uh, overall. We actually need, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be making spam uneconomical. You don't have to get rid of all of it, you just have to make it too difficult and too expensive for them to want to do it. This is actually also true for harassment and for um, like abuse on your systems. You have the same, you're, you can't always get rid of all of it, but we can make it undesirable to do so. Okay. The first thing you do is you don't go full ML. Don't go full machine learning, you're not there yet. What you can start with is very simple heuristics of like how many blocks is this user getting from people that they, like, they follow or they at reply, and you actually just have some like bare bone numbers of like, if a, no, if a user over this time period has been getting this many blocks and has sent this many tweets in reply to somebody else and this many blocks from those people that it replied, you can actually just set some dumb heuristic numbers and you start there. And what'll happen is, if your spammers are smart, which they're not yet probably, if you haven't, don't have any anti-spam solutions yet, if they're not smart yet, they might just give up. A few of them will very quickly figure out the outlines of your heuristics, of your counts, and they will slide underneath it. Um, but you can do, like, most of the work with that, those simple systems. And then what you can do is you start, because you don't want to work on ML, because ML is a trickier problem, but you can use that data to start building out ML. And you can also do things, you need to build feedback loops that are both true positive and false positives. So I, this is actually a failure mode of a lot of social networks where they have ways to say somebody is spammy, but they don't have a way for folks to say that they're not spammy. That's like why Facebook has this other inbox. That's why Gmail has a spam folder. You need feedback loops in both directions. Uh, and from the feedback loops, plus your heuristic systems, plus some advice from your trust and safety folks, the people who are on the ground, like handling suspension and whatnot, you can start building out um, a real robust automated solution. Also, Every s company I know has a system in which they can apply regexes to messages so that agents can plug in regexes and just knock people out. Everybody builds that. It's super powerful. They always have an incident where the regex was wrong. Uh, it always happens, but you can build in safety nets around that stuff. And that's a very common first system. If you're like early days, I would recommend heuristics and regexes and stuff is like, not the worst thing in the world. And it can be asynchronous, it doesn't have to be in the right path. You can let the message come in and then remove it, and then build up from there. It's, we can talk afterwards. Sorry, I have like apparently a million opinions about this. Um, we can talk about it more, there's a, there's a bunch of ideas. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, sorry. So uh, you just said that if statements would add local complexity, but they would have global simplicity, correct? Yeah, global resiliency, and then also often global simplicity, yeah. Could you explain that? How would that if statement put yeah, 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 that yeah. statement? Yeah, 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 okay. So, well, I can more easily address the global resiliency side of this. The global simplicity, you're gonna have to, we're, we are gonna have to walk down a garden path. Um, the global resiliency comes because you can more easily and more quickly fix bugs by turning off features. And you can also deploy and bring back code without having to do the crazy merge commit solution instead of, and then do a deploy and get it through whatever deploy systems you've got. You can find problems easier. It's also easier for you to ship code that maybe is less good, but you can experimentally see if it works and see what kind of problems it's going to have. That kind of like adds up over time to being more resilient. When I say global simplicity, I mean there are going to be views 
when I'm talking about simplicity, I mean the simplicity of not having to do those merge commits, not having to do those git reverts and then fix up the code, not having to think about, okay, we did all this work and we, well, we didn't make it back to compatible because we had all these if statements turned on, because we didn't have these, because we didn't think about it in that way, that you're going to start having to think about when you add these if statements. You start imagining backwards compatibility built in. And when you start doing that, you start having to worry about things like, okay, if I roll back this patch, that means I have to also roll back these like schema changes or these other data changes that we made to these other systems. And that is complicated and it's difficult and it requires deep introspective thought every time you do it when it's just this dumb bug. When for every little dumb bug you deploy that you have out, instead of building out these feature flags, if you think about these things with backwards compatibility and feature flags initially and up front, you, you, have, you get better responses and you can think about these systems in a, in a quick way. You can also hand this stuff off to SREs or ops people or whatever you call them where they can go, oh, we just deployed these number of things and we have these toggles for it or we're having a problem with these systems and we know that if we, when these systems start going flaky, like who to follow or whatever, we can decider it off and we can, we can turn the feature flag off and we actually have like a, it's a much simpler interface instead of having to deal with every problem up front. That's kind of what I'm getting at, I guess. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, that was amazing and uh, give it up one more time for Jeff. Thank you.